My name is Julia Bennell. I'm the Dean of Leeds University Business School and I will be chairing this session. Um, and I'm delighted to introduce our very esteemed um, panel here. Uh, first of all, we've got um, Deborah Humphreys, who is the Vice Chancellor of the University of Brighton and also a member of the All Party Parliamentary University Group. Previously, she was uh, Pro Rector at Imperial and also before that PVC at the University of Southampton. We also have uh, Roberta Blackman Woods, who is the chair of the Board of Governors of Northumbria University, previously an MP for the city of Durham, um, and also spent time as an academic, fellow academic. Um, and um, last but not least, we have the Right Honourable Lord David Willits, uh, who's a member of the House of Lords and previously an MP for Havant in Hampshire and also previously the Minister of State for Universities and Science. So thank you very much to the panel for spending this time with us. Um, so we will kick off as we have all the other sessions where each of our panelists will give approximately five minutes um, introduction. Please feel free to use the um, chat to start um, posing your questions which I will do my best to follow and put into some kind of coherent order and after we've been through all three of our speakers um, we can kick off the discussion. So Deborah over to you. Julia thank you very much and, and colleagues um, thank you for the very kind invitation to contribute to the conference. Um, two things first, first I wanted to say thank you to all my colleagues, all my uh, university colleagues who are on this call uh, for all your hard work, your commitment uh, and support to get students through what has been an extraordinary time since um, March of this year. Um, so thank you very much. And I think there can be little, there is very clearly in this pandemic an illustration of just how powerful and important universities are in our communities, our economies, um, and to the country as a whole. Uh, the question or the focus of this topic is the direction of UK HE policy in uncertain times. And I just wanted to pick up a few points to, to start off the conversation. I mean, the first and obvious glaring point is there is no UK policy. Um, we have devolved nations. So my reflections are entirely English. And clearly there is increasing divergence across um, the devolved administration. I think the, co the, the pandemic, the context of Brexit, climate change, um, presents an extraordinary opportunity for the government on a cross-departmental basis to shape policy and to recognise the importance of a diverse higher education sector in, in England. Um, that diversity goes from potentially research elite universities to professional technical vocational universities, different sizes and shapes of universities, and ranges of disciplines and um, research endeavors. For me, powering the, the power of the business school, as I see it in my experiences today, have been really about working really closely, powering up local economies, SMEs, creating business entrepreneurs and leaders of the future. Um, in, in so many areas. And I think now is a time when, as the economy has to really rethink and we get the opportunity to really reshape our economy, now is a real time for business schools to step forward. I think also in terms of the opportunity the government has and has set out in terms of life chances, as we post, as we get into the post-Brexit arena, is how we level up and give people those greater opportunities. And I welcome the Prime Minister's announcement about a lifelong skills offer, um, but that will have really significant implications for how we organise ourselves as institutions. And no matter what else we do, we have to create a sustainable economy. Um, there is still a climate emergency. This isn't getting any better. And I think we have the real potential, certainly in, in developments in, at Brighton, such as the Green Growth Platform and various other developments across the country to really think about how we build back greener. Thank you. Great. 
Thank you, Deborah. And I think, um, yeah, I, I, I concur about um, we are such a diverse sector, but but often forced to to kind of compete in in a, a what they perceive as a level playing field, which doesn't always bring the best outcomes. Thank you, um, Roberta. Okay, um, I was intending to go through a couple of slides, but I think given the technical difficulties that I've had today, that I think I'm just, um, I think they're going to put them in the bar as a link so that people can click on them. Um, so, uh, well, thank you very much for um, being able to come and speak the, this afternoon. Um, I think like Deborah, I want to start by just saying um, a huge thank you to all the staff in um, our universities. Um, I know that if Northumbria is an example of what is going on across the country, then staff are really going the extra mile in support of students at the moment. And I also would want to acknowledge the work of student unions in supporting their fellow students because um, from what I've seen, it really um, is amazing. And it's clearly a very difficult time, not only for universities, but the country at large. Um, I have split what I want to say this afternoon into two bits. And the first, um, I, well, I want to emphasize what Deborah said, of course, there is no UK policy. So, um, and I haven't gone through all the four nations because there just isn't time, but I'm going to just talk about a couple of the policy drivers and then what I think this means for business schools. So I wanted to start with the emphasis that I think is still there from the government on skills and productivity. And that is actually something that is shared across the whole four nations. Um, and the second driver is how universities are now being expected to step up to the levelling up agenda. That is particularly important to us in Northumbria as we seek to work in the northeast and to help with the growth of the economy in the northeast um, post um, COVID and actually post Brexit as well. Um, but of course, universities are being expected to work with FE colleges and to work in a tertiary based system locally. Now, I don't think we've worked through that. I don't think we all know exactly what that means in practice, but that's certainly the policy driver. I also think um, that research strategy is worth looking at and perhaps focusing on more than we might have done previously because of its emphasis on place and on sectors, particularly digital technology, uh, green energy, health, and so on. Um, the fourth point I'd raise is about diversity. I know this was um, also something Deborah raised. It's more important than ever. And it's everything from board rooms to access and participation plans. And again, I think there are a whole set of issues there that universities are still working through. And my final um, policy driver, so the fifth one, is um, about flexibility. Employers um, want more bite-sized learning, so do employees, and we have to think about lifelong learning and how to support this. And of course, Michelle Donnell has come out with the Lifelong Learning Fund, which is really um, very interesting. Um, very quickly to go through what I think the, um, the impact um, of this is on business schools, um, greater emphasis on digital technology and green skills a uh, greater priority on diversity and inclusion. Global but local reach is really important and I think a growing role in supporting knowledge exchange and business development locally. Um, an ability to demonstrate adding value, bringing employers and universities together. Um, this has obviously always been important for business schools, but I do think we're seeing a step change now and um, much greater pressure from government, um, rightly in my view, to deliver on this and building management and leadership capability, because without that, we won't get the um, growth and productivity that we need. So um, I hope I just about stuck to, to five minutes and obviously we'll take questions later. Thank you. Great. 
Thanks, Roberta. And um, yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right. The business school's got a real key role to play with how we connect into the local economy and um, connect with the local organisations to 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 bring bring forward recovery. Um, so let me pass to David. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to join you. Uh, and I agree with what Deborah and Roberta. I've already said both about the the role that universities have been playing in this crisis. Uh, there was a surprising amount of media skepticism about people being able to return to university, and it was tricky in those first few weeks. But everybody has indeed worked fantastically hard, and has shown it is possible to do that uh, even with the virus still in our midst. And I also very much agree with what Roberta said about leveling up. But I just let me just add three kind of trends which seem to me to be the backdrop against which business schools will be operating. First, there is a something which I unleashed, probably not fully expecting how pervasive it would become, and that is Leo data, earnings data, um, which I think is uh, interesting and important information. I don't think it is the be all and end all of university performance and shouldn't be used on its own as a measure of university performance. Uh, but it's interesting extra information to add to the mix. It's often interpreted as. Oh, that was that's a. Sorry. That's live on Zoom. That was wonderful. <laughs> that was wonderful. Um, someone is uh, obviously very interested in keeping Leo data. Um, right. Uh, where was it? Yes, Leo data. So at the moment, I think if anything, there's a danger of excess weight being placed on Leo data. But it's often been seen as making the case for STEM subjects. Whereas, of course, if you dig into it and look at the courses uh, which produce higher graduate earnings over the decade that's been measured, which may not be the same as lifetime, uh, top of the list is, is not STEM, but LEM. It is law, economics and management. Uh, and so, although in general, I warn the sector not to get too carried away with Leo data, actually the case for business courses and management courses is if anything supported by Leo data. And given that we're all entitled to use any bit of evidence around that helps our case, I fully understand it if business school wanted to draw attention to that. It's wrong to think that it's, this is solely a story of STEM. First point. Uh, second point, uh, going back to the summer, I think there is some very, there's a very important lesson here in the, uh, all the problems we had around uh, exam results, grading and access to university. Because I think we began that process with ministers trying to hold quite a tough line on uh, A-level grades and access to university against a backdrop of a media narrative, too many people go, what's the point of going to university? You don't really get much out of it. Um, but you then had, you then moved from the kind of politics of what people write in articles in the Express or the Telegraph to the political reality of the aspiration of many young people and their parents for those young people to get to university. And we ended up uh, despite the surrounding media narrative, with, if anything, another big surge in the number of people getting places at university. And I think any politician who was at the heart of that fraught few weeks will have drawn the lesson that trying to stop people getting to university when that's really what they want to do is an incredibly difficult and hard thing to do. It's far better to accept that one of the features of a modern society and modern economy, and it's both an economic driver and a social and cultural driver, is increasing numbers of young people want to go to university and then trying to ensure that at university they have opportunities for vocational and technical as well as academic training is a far better way forward than trying to stand there with a big cross no entry sign trying to deter them from going in the first place. That is incredibly hard to do. Um, my my third point, um, I think when Roberta referred briefly to this, is the research agenda. Because I think the, bit, the case of business schools is one of the most powerful examples of what has gone wrong with research assessment, both in the REF and in academic promotion. Uh, and if I may say so, there's now a shameless plug coming. I discuss this in my book on university, university education 
where I have a section on business schools and this issue. And let's face it, the way to get a high ranking in the ref in a business school and to get the kind of prestigious publications that uh, will shape an academic career is not to help your business school serve the local economy. It's to get published in the most prestigious academic journals for business studies, almost all of which are American. And the main criterion for which is uh, innovative statistical techniques in the use of large data sets. The large data sets themselves are predominantly of US business sectors. So writing, the example I give in my book, is writing a historical study of the impact of electrification on the US steel industry is far more likely to get you promotion and status in the world of academic research assessment than what can we do to contribute to the performance of the economy of the Northeast. And I think Ottilyn Lizer's and Amanda Tholoway's recent remarks about the REF are a recognition of this problem. If we are indeed to have a healthy research ecosystem, then studying the local economy, studying the effectiveness of a welfare to work program in the Northeast is as valuable as the kind of studies that will get you into the most prestigious journals. And there is this, this review of the REF, I think is an opportunity to do this. And I think it will, I hope, enable business schools to do better in future, but connecting the research which drives prestige in academia and the actual applied value of business schools to the local economy. Great. Thank you very much.